reading from Acts 19, 1 through 10. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, and he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall at Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and I've, I've worn my look at me shirt, so hopefully no one will fall asleep today. Forget that, all right. What's that? I quit. It's not a disco shirt. Just, just saying. I got this shirt. It used to be the front page, like the Amazon ad. So that's where that came from. So yeah. All right. That's self-deprecating. Let's move on. Well, we're in Acts 19, so we're moving right along here. And um, we've seen in Acts a lot of times when the gospel goes to a, a new group of people, like the Samaritans, right? That something different changes. There's some kind of these steps that the Holy Spirit goes through to show the people who would go, wait, that's not right, that actually God is doing this amazing work. And we have a similar thing going on in this passage today, but I think it's um, the people that are represented in this passage today are very much like the people that we meet every day today. So I think it's really appropriate um, to how we um, approach people uh, with the gospel message. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll jump right into chapter 19, verse 1. Father, we are here once again because um, you have promised to be with your people and lead us and guide us and to... Uh, bring us into a greater knowledge of the truth so that we can be transformed from the inside out. And, Father, that's what we, we long for. Uh, we long for these, uh, this restraint of our old nature to be torn away so that we could be who we really are in Christ. And, but uh, that time is not yet. But until then, Lord, we, we just pray that your spirit would continue to work in and through us and sanctify us. And that more and more we would hearken ourselves to, to hear the voice of your spirit speaking through us, especially in, in times like these as, as your word is presented. The Father, work with us, work in us, uh, change us, do what you will so that you are glorified in this place. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in chapter 19, we have um, kind of the segue from Apollos, who has been left in Corinth. Remember, he was uh, kind of didn't know everything, and, and uh, Priscilla and Aquila had to bring him up to speed on the gospel message, and once he got it, he was off and doing his thing in Corinth and building the church up in Corinth. And now the text moves back to, well, what's going on with Paul? Where, where is Paul on all this? So the first point is simply this. Uh, we see that religious people get saved. Religious people get saved. And, and uh, if you don't know what that means, then you're probably a, a pretty new to the gospel because there's a difference between religious people and people who are saved, as the Bible would talk about. Look at the uh, first few verses here. When Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. This is in modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, No, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, 
They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So in chapter 19, we find Paul encounters some disciples. And apparently these disciples uh, are not disciples of Jesus because they know nothing of the Spirit. They know nothing of Jesus. They were disciples of John the Baptist or maybe even someone calling himself John the Baptist. We do have some records of that, that there were actual followers of John the Baptist who didn't know about Jesus because they were throughout the Roman Empire. And there were also people, because John was very popular, that were posing as teachers that were John the Baptist or close related to him to get, you know, money or whatever kind of stuff. So whatever they are, they were disciples of somebody, probably John the Baptist, because that's what Paul references later on. And they resemble Apollos in a number of ways. Like they kind of have some gaps in knowledge. But the differences between Apollos and these disciples uh, kind of outweigh uh, themselves a lot. The similarities aren't as, um, as apparent. Remember, Apollos taught the word accurately. He knew the gospel accurately. He knew about Jesus. He was fervent in the Holy Spirit. So he was indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Apollos was saved, but yet had some gaps in his theology. But the same can't be said of this group. These disciples, no, by the way, the, dis the word disciple, mathetes, means simply learner, right? So if it wasn't in a biblical context, we would translate that learner, right? So they are learners, they're disciples, and they had received a baptism of repentance from probably John, which was in itself was a good thing, right? They were on the way, they had repented. But unlike Apollos, they didn't know anything about Jesus. They're disciples, but they're not disciples that know anything about the Messiah. But some would say, well, wait a minute, it says, uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They believed, right? Well, again, the question is, but in what? Um, obviously, to me, they didn't believe in Jesus because once you believe in Jesus, you have the Spirit. And without the Spirit, you can't be saved, right? The Spirit is the one who saves us, regenerates us. So if there is no Holy Spirit in their lives, they are not Christians. They're simply learners of Christianity or learners of biblical doctrine. So what did they believe in? I think what he's saying is when you believe in the teachings of John, what happened to you? What, what, how were you baptized? Did you go further than John? Do you see what John was saying about the Messiah to come? And so uh, they had re realized the promises of Messiah coming maybe, but they don't realize Messiah had come in Jesus. Uh, so they were believing, and this is important to distinguish it, they were believing in the promise of God, but not the fulfillment. Fulfillment. They had good theology, they were religious, but they did not know God. And they had good religion, they had good doctrine, they knew the correct things. They knew about repentance, they knew what John was teaching for the most part. But they did not know about Jesus, did not know about the coming of the Spirit, did not know about conversion. They were short on that. And so, you know, Paul, the kind of the questions here are a little bit you got to kind of take it, like, what is Paul actually doing here? Is he actually interviewing them, or is he a little bit confused about what is going on with them? So probably maybe he saw something in their behavior, in their demeanor, how they were interacting with people in the synagogue. And so he began to ask them some questions, because they, they seem like maybe they're believers. They have some stuff correct, but yet there's something just not there. And so he was, it was pretty clear that Paul and this, this group here did not possess the Holy Spirit, again, who indwells all believers. Um, and so he's going, so have you heard about the Holy Spirit? No. Well, okay, wait a minute. Did, you were baptized? Yes. Well, what baptism? He's kind of trying to figure out where are they coming from. And he comes to realize they did not receive the Spirit. And that's an important thing. In Romans 8, uh, chap chapter 8, verse 9, Remember, Paul says this clearly and emphatically. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. The possession of the Spirit of God is one of the distinguishing marks of a true believer. You can have all the right doctrine, you can have all the right belief, but if you haven't been transformed, if you haven't been converted, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you do not belong to God. You are lost. And so after a discussion about the Spirit and baptism in Jesus, after Paul explains really probably the gospel to them in fullness, they believe. They believe not only in John's repentance, but also now in the gospel message. And so Paul lays hands on them, and they experience the uh, Spirit's presence and power. Kind of this mini-Pentecost happens again. They speak in tongues, and they prophesy. 
and kind of this, the, the presence of spirit is well known by all that something has happened different. They believed in repentance, they believed in the religious stuff, they believed in John's teaching, but now they have the spirit of God, they respond to the gospel. Later on, uh, as Paul's writing to Corinthians, uh, he urges them to examine themselves to see if they're in the faith. Because many people can think they are in the faith, they really are true believers, but they're not. And so Paul over and over and over encourages them in 2 Corinthians 13 uh, to examine themselves to see if they're in the faith. And in 1 John, John does the same thing. He comes up to these, these three tests. If you're a true believer, you will pass these three tests, and, and we'll get to them in a second. A doctrinal test, an ethical test, and an experiential test. Those are the ways we examine ourselves. What, where does our doctrine stand? How do we live our lives, kind of the ethics of our lives? And what's our experience of God's presence in our life? Look at, for, I'll, I'll read part of that uh, argument of John. It's from 1 John chapter 1, 5 through 7, and then chapter 3, verse 24. And in fact, it's through the whole gospel of, I mean, excuse me, the first letter of John, this kind of talk about examining ourselves. And so Paul says this, This is the message we have heard from him and declares to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, and he is in the, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. And so doctrine is we examine ourselves, Doctrine, we have to believe in the real Jesus and what he did. There's a lot of Jesuses out there. Right? People present Jesus that aren't the true Jesus. You know, Jesus the good teacher, right? Jesus the one who died for sin, but not all sin, some sin. There's a lot of Jesuses out there, right? But we have to believe in the in the real Jesus and what he did. And, and I have in the in the outline there some scriptures you can look up later on. It talks about that throughout First John. Ethically. We will walk in the light. We will walk in, in love. We will begin to act and have fruit of the Spirit like the, the Spirit would produce in us. So we don't just believe in Jesus, get the ticket to heaven, and then live our lives as if we've never been transformed. So if you live a life of increasing sin and you don't care about the things of God, that's probably, even though you might have prayed the prayer, that's probably a sign that you really haven't trusted in Christ. Experientially, you'll know that you believe because the Spirit's presence will be in your life. You will sense that God is, is with you. And so Paul here basically forces John the Baptist's disciples to kind of examine themselves. And in doing so, it leads to their conversion. Oh, we, we just know a little bit. We don't know Messiah has come and died, paid a penalty, and I need to respond personally to that. It's not just about repentance, being sorry, but now it's to accept the the, uh, the forgiveness that's given to us in Christ. And so here's the point. There are a lot of people who believe in God, know some Bible stuff, and practice their religion, fer religion fervently, but do not really know Jesus, and therefore are lost. There are a lot of people who practice their religion with much more fervor and passion than real Christians do, but they don't know Jesus. It's not because we don't, we're not saved by how religious we are or the things that we do. We're saved by a person, by Jesus, who is alive and wants to live in and through us. Remember what Jesus said? These are some of the most uh, fearful verses for me in, in the scriptures, uh, especially as I was walking towards faith early on in my life. Verse 21, Jesus says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? Do we not give good sermons in your name? Do we not drive out demons? We did some miraculous stuff in your name and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. It's about knowing God. And so Paul was aware of that. Paul was away. He lived in a day where everyone and everything was religious. Everywhere you look, more so than in our day, right? 
Everywhere you, every city you went to, what did you find? The first thing you walk into, temples and statues to gods and goddesses all over the place. And then from there you go to the synagogue and, and more religion with, right, without real faith. And then if there was no synagogue, you go to these places of prayer, right? And still more religion, people who try to worship God and were very, very religious, but did not know God. And it's the same thing today, but we'll get to that later on. So the scriptures go on, verse 6, it says, when uh, Paul placed his hands on them, and again, the word when isn't in the original Greek here. It could be translated, having placed his hands on them. So there's really no time stamp, but when is a good translation of it, so we'll just go with that. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So throughout the book of Acts, we've had this usual pattern when someone meets Jesus, right? They repent, they believe in Jesus, and then they are baptized, right? You see that pattern 80% of the time, right? There's a belief in Jesus, there's a repentance, and they believe, and then they're baptized, brought into the church through baptism. This is a very difficult passage to understand because what happens here, it's seemingly that the men are baptized prior to receiving the Holy Spirit. So they believe, they, they repent, they believe, they are baptized, but the Spirit doesn't come upon them immediately. When you believe, if you were to believe right now, the Spirit would immediately enter you. But here, it doesn't seem to happen. But it's not the first time that has that, that happened this way. When uh, uh, Paul was persecuting the church, remember Philip went to Samaria, and he was talking to someone there, and it says those who accepted his message received, uh, they were baptized, but they didn't receive the Spirit till later on. Remember when Peter and John came and laid hands, and the Spirit came later on. And that was for the purpose of showing the whole world that Samaritans were now welcome into the church. It had to be visibly seen by Peter and, uh, and John to kind of put that stamp of approval on that uh, situation. So when we come to a passage like this, Disciples speaking in other tongues and, and prophesying, you know, kind of the salvation experience after baptism. It's difficult to kind of understand how that fits in, in um, redemptive history. But remember, these signs, like those in the ones in Samaria, were visible public indicators that the people that have now believed in Jesus have now possessed the Spirit and can be accepted into the church. Remember, this is a world where... The Jews are going, yeah, it's okay if you believe in the Messiah, Jesus. Many of them are saying that, but Gentiles, Samaritans, you know, Romans, and there had to be this additional sign that said, yes, God is saying, yeah. See, they have the same spirit. And you see that kind of that similar quote. We know they're part of the body of Christ because they received the same spirit that we did. And so God is working in this group as well. And I think that's what kind of what's going on today. Even though the pattern isn't universal in Acts, sometimes Luke mentions signs and wonders. Sometimes he doesn't mention signs and wonders. But it's not like he says that signs and wonders didn't happen when he doesn't mention it. It's, it's just uh, Luke's way of communicating what's going on here. So are they typical? Are they normal? It's not an easy question to answer in, the, in this book of Acts here. But we can know this. Luke seems to have emphasized the mention of these gifts when the reception of the Holy Spirit in his account primarily uh, where the church felt that readers need to be assured that the group which the converts belonged to were really accepted by the Lord, like I mentioned. So the Samaritans, right, in chapter 8, the Spirit comes on, there are signs and wonders. Oh, Samaritans can be part of the church. Gentiles, right, later on in chapter 10, same thing. And here in this case, disciples of John. Right. Can disciples of John who were allegiant to, to John and John alone, can they now follow Christ? Is that okay? Same thing is going on here. So the evidence is that this is the Spirit coming upon them. And the Messiah that John, if you're confused, the Messiah that John was talking about is no one else but this Jesus who was crucified. It's not some other Messiah to come. It is Jesus. So the men here, they make a choice to follow Jesus. And they're baptized as a public affirmation of that choice, which is a very cultural standard. No one would have questioned that. When you align yourself with, a, with this religion, you would be baptized. It was very typical for Jewish people. They wouldn't have thought twice about that sort of thing. But having completed that act, that 
that that uh, uh, ordinance, Paul now affirms that choice by laying hands on them and this, conferring the Spirit to them, and the Holy Spirit comes to validate Paul's message and the salvation of those men, and that God is working again through this person, Jesus Christ. And so, the key here to, to take away and we get in the application is that it's a big difference between religion and Christianity, between knowing about Christianity and having a good head knowledge and even a, even a fantastic theology that fires outweighs any Christian that really believes in Jesus, that you, you can have all that and still not know God. The second thing, the second question that kind of comes up in this passage is, as a church, where should the church really meet? This is a question that's asked throughout history. Um, wh where's the best place for a church to kind of gather together? So look at um, verse 8, where should the church meet? Paul entered the synagogue, and he spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them eventually became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them, and he took the disciples with him. And by the way, disciples at this point probably doesn't mean just the 12. He'd been there a number of years. It probably means all the disciples, all the followers of Jesus with him, and he had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that, important word there, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. They heard the word of the Lord. Why? Because Paul moved to the lecture hall of Tyrannus. That's the thing. So he was preaching there publicly for two years, and the word went out from there. So as was his custom, we all know this, Paul pinches a city. The first place he goes is the synagogue. If there's no synagogue, he tries to find some other religious place, a place of prayer, whatever, wherever it might be. Where do people who are seeking after the Messiah go? And so he's uh, already visited previously this Ephesian synagogue, and now he goes back again. He's able to stay longer. And unlike other synagogue experiences in other churches or the towns, I should say, Paul taught for three months. It's a long time before anybody gave me pushback. Usually it's almost immediate. Paul goes and he preaches and they go, oh, we don't want this. But he's there for three months and he preaches. There's very little pushback until now opposition, as we know, will always come. Might not come right away, but eventually will come. And so this suggests maybe that the Ephesians were a little bit more open than other cities were to the gospel message. And so some of them became believers, but others persisted in their unbelief, refused to believe, and others became uh, antagonistic, and they maligned the way. The way was, um, Christians weren't always called Christians. Initially, they were called the way, probably coming from what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so that's how Christians were publicly referred to initially. And so they were slandering, slandering the church, the gospel. Um, and so Paul does some um, things that he's done before, but in a little different way. Remember in, in uh, chapter 18 in Corinth, when um, pressure came, Paul simply said, okay, I'm not going to teach here anymore. I'm going to go someplace else and teach. And he, and he began to go to a different location to, to continue his teaching. And um, the same thing is going on here. Once per per persecution once again begins, Paul chooses a different location. But the location is way different than anything else Paul ever chooses. He goes to the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Now, a lecture hall uh, could be a number of things. It could be um, a place where kind of philosophy, kind of the Areopagus was, right? A bunch where philosophers met and you would discuss different ideas. It could have been that mixed with the gymnasium, right? Where exercise would happen. Because a lot of times those things were blended in the ancient world. And so whatever this place is, it's the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Presumption here, if Tyrannus is still there and it's his lecture hall, then he's probably a Greek because of his name. He was probably a public teacher of philosophy or, or rhetoric or something like that in the hall that he sponsored, and people would come and debate different things. Or it could simply be it's the lecture hall of Tyrannus, a guy who was very wealthy, who died years before, and they named it after him. That happened as well. So we really don't know if Tyrannus is contemporary or not. Um, so whatever the situation, Paul has gone to a secular place. No longer a religious place as he um, begins to preach. So Paul chose 
to uh, plant the gospel here or churches in major cities. So this is what he's doing in Ephesus. He's being strategic. So from city centers, other churches in other areas are often started. It's really at this point, very close to Ephesus, we have the seven churches in Revelation. This is when these churches began, probably began. We don't have anything in the scriptures that says Paul planted a church in Laodicea, for example. But this is why. He planted a church in Ephesus, and from Ephesus, Christians went out, went back, did business, did trading, whatever they were doing, and those churches began because he chose the city center. And what's really interesting here, this is the first instance ever in the scriptures where, again, it's a secular place, completely secular. It's not a synagogue that he's teaching anymore. It's not at a temple, like in Jerusalem. It's not even at a, a place of prayer where religious people gathered. And it's not in homes, which was part of it as well. It's, um, it's they meet in a hall of Tyrannus, this, this secular place of philosophy, a public place. It would be like going to, the, to a, well, malls are kind of defunct now, but going to a place where people gather this public place, and say, I'm going to start teaching here. And people began to gather. And so um, it's quite possible that um, still as a general practice, the Christians in Ephesus met in homes as well. I think that was probably going on because of the, the nature of Paul was teaching. There was fellowship stuff that had to go on. But we see that they primarily meet in a hall, in a public building, and, and that was not a house. Uh, and um, it's not a one-time occasion. It says that they gathered daily for two years. They go into the secular building for two years, which means they met in this hall hundreds of times, over and over and over again. And so, and this is why you have that, those very important in English two words, so that they met there consistently in a public place, talking about the gospel for two years, and the result, so that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia, everybody that lived in modern-day Turkey and a little bit beyond, heard the word of the Lord. From Ephesus, the word went out throughout all Asia. Um, this is uh, really, really important to understand because uh, there's a this cause and result that goes on. When we strategize and, see, and follow God's leading by His Spirit, God brings about fruit. And when we don't, we don't get fruit because we're doing things in our own power and our, or in our own uh, strategies, which are always lacking. So here's the question. Where does God desire his church to meet? Now, in one sense, you can say, kind of the pat answer is uh, anywhere and everywhere, right? We're all supposed to meet anywhere and everywhere. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But in a, in a regular sense, where do we, where should a church meet? Should the church meet in, in, a, in a coffee shop with four or five of us gathered together? Yeah, I think it's a, right? Everybody, everybody here would go, yeah, it's appropriate. Uh, should the church meet in a multi-million dollar church with billions of rooms and a gold background? We might go. So we can, we can go in the extremes, but the question is, what about everything in between, right? Where should we me it is what it, what would God be ultimately pleased with in where we meet so I think the, the, the answer to the question kind of kind of led you astray it's, it's not a question of where we should meet it's a question of why we should meet so it's a matter of stewardship and, and strategy so if, if we didn't have the funds here to maintain these buildings we don't go, we wouldn't necessarily say, oh, church disband. We're still the church. We find a place to meet. Stewardship, right? If, if, we, um, if we have a limited amount of funds, we don't say, I think next week we should be a mega church. And um, you know, build a 7,000 person you know, thing. That's not good stewardship. The question is, it's a matter of a balance of stewardship and strategy. Right? It's not where, but why? So for Paul, the strategy of meeting in a public secular place to present Jesus in the marketplace of ideas paid off immensely. The question we have to ask ourselves, meeting like this in a church 
building on Sunday morning, is that the wisest place for us to meet? I'm not saying it isn't. I'm saying, do we ask the question? Because if we never ask the question, all we're going to do is meet in the synagogue and never go to the Hall of Tyrannus. And if we never go to the Hall of Tyrannus, there will never be a so that that comes afterwards. Right? What does God want us to do? Why has he called us? What's the strategy that we have for meeting the generation that God has called us to? We'll get to that in the application. Here's the application. Two points real quick. Really important, uh, and this is one of the most offensive things that... Um, I can probably say to the world in general, but this is this is the point of application. Often, religious people, like those disciples we talked about, are in reality unconverted people. Religious people, many times, are simply unconverted people. They're religious people. They know about the Bible, might know more than you. That should not be, but they might. But they don't know Jesus. They're unconverted. Um, you can look at popular cults. Mormonism. Uh, Mormons are some of the most faithful, passionate people about their, their they go door to door. They send their kids out on mission trip required, right? They are passionate. But they're totally wrong. Jehovah's Witnesses, too? Jehovah's Witnesses, the same thing, right? I know they're wrong. Yeah, and Christian science. You can pick a cult, right? A lot of cults out there. They're very, very religious, very, very fervent. But you have to be fervent about the truth, right? I mean, I, I can be fervent that I can fly and jump out of a plane. I can believe it with all my heart, but it's not going to end well for me, right? You have to be fervent about the truth. And so most of our society identifies as spiritual or I'm Christian. Or I'm Christian because my parents were Christian and I went to church as a kid. Um... We all know about people that only attend church on religious times, like Christmas and Easter, right? That's a thing. Uh, they know the basic truths, but there's no sign of regeneration. There's no sign of, I want to follow Jesus with everything that's in me. And so, like the disciples in this passage, they were believing in the promises of God. They believe in the promise but they don't understand the fulfillment of those promises. So we hear this talk all the time. I believe in God. I mean, you've heard that. People say, I, I believe in God. Almost defensive. Well, I'm a Christian. I follow, well, I believe in God. Right? Kind of defensive. Right? Um, I, if you ask a common person, what, did Jesus, what was Jesus' ministry? And they do know about, if they do know about Jesus, they'll say, well, Jesus died for the sins of the world. That's absolutely correct. Does it make him a Christian? No. I go to church. I've been baptized. I've done this. I've done that. It's all this type of modern religious language is simply communicating the right belief. They believe the promises, but they have not incorporated those promises by meeting the author personally of those promises and seeing the fulfillment in Jesus. Um, you have to incorporate those promises into your life the way the Bible tells us we have to. The commands of God, right? Believe in the Lord Jesus. Really trust in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. This is why we have to explain the gospel to religious people as much as we do to secular people who have no concept of who God is. See, what people don't need is more religion. People do not need to go to church any more than they do, for example. They don't necessarily have to read the Bible any more than they do. What people don't need is even more information. What they need is to repent. Can you say that again? What they need is to repent and believe in Jesus, meet Jesus. A lot of people want to want the Jesus without the repent. We see throughout Acts, there is no Jesus without repenting. You can't say, I want to save you without recognizing that you need to be saved from something. Right? So you must repent. Repent and believe. And I think we've gotten soft in evangelicalism. We, we talk a lot about how God loves people. And all this is true, right? It's not like it's not true. But it's how we weigh it. 
Just believe God accepts you right as you are, right? No. God does not accept you right where you are. Right where you are is lost in sin. God accepts you in Christ when you repent and believe. And then wherever you are there, right, doesn't mean you have to get right, but you have to repent. You have to recognize who you are, and, and, right? He doesn't accept you if you don't repent. He doesn't accept you if you think there's another way to heaven beside. God does not accept you the way you are. Now, I know what people mean by that. It means you don't have to do a lot of work. You have to try to be more Christian before you believe. Yes, that's all true. But if you think about when we say something like that, how someone might perceive that language is a problem. God wants you to repent, to recognize you're lost and destitute without him. And what you, what you do with your normal life is simply rebellion against God. You need to repent of your rebellion, trust in Jesus, and receive the mercy and the grace and the love and the peace that God wants to give you that only comes through repentance and, and belief. People don't necessarily need more information. Um, some do, but, but what they need is to meet Jesus. They need to repent. Second point of uh, application is um, ask yourself. It's kind of an ex examining idea a little bit, but the hub of your life is what? If your life is a wheel, the hub is what holds everything together. The hub of your life it, it is what? Uh, one Greek manuscript of this passage uh, in Acts chapter 19, verse 9, says that a little addition. It says, Paul taught in the hall of Tyrannus uh, from the fifth hour to the tenth hour. That is, he taught there from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Now, that detail uh, is probably lad added later because it only appears in later manuscripts of the Bible. So it wasn't in the original, but it does give us some historical insight to the passage. Uh, that period, 5th to 10th hour, 11 o'clock to 4 o'clock, was typically when workers had their midday meal and their kind of like a siesta, kind of the afternoon nap, right? It just The midday was where people kind of shut down from their, their work early in the morning. Remember, it was an agricultural society, so you'd be up, be up very, very early, and then you would, um, you would uh, do your midday nothingness, and then you would stay up late, and you go to sleep for a little bit, then you'd wake up, right, in the middle of the night. People would, we, the modern age is the only time we sleep through the night. Most of the world didn't sleep before this, the night. It was like freak flight sleep. You go to bed early, you wake up about one or two, you talk, you do the thing, and you go back to bed again, right? So this is kind of the pattern here that kind of, that, that was, Paul was uh, doing. And so when people aren't working, when people are kind of just talking and kind of having their leisure time, is when Paul was at work time. And so probably, I'm assuming during the, those other hours, he was maybe making tents or repairing things or doing his, his thing. But when it came to the time when people were most aware, when people were most ready to hear the gospel, that's when Paul began to teach. And he continues to teach there for two years, over and over and over and over again. So much of the reason for Paul's success in Ephesus was because of his persistence, and his focus. The gospel was not a side job for Paul. He, again, the scripture says he daily met with others for the sake of the gospel, either to tell them about Jesus or encourage them in their walk with Jesus. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Notice the hub of Paul's life. The gospel was not an add-on to his life. It was his life. The bulk of his day was the gospel. Paul still did his work, and Paul did his, you know, his, his hobbies and whatever else he did. We don't really know, right? Whatever family he might have had. All that stuff, Paul did. But it was not the hub. The gospel was the hub. That was his life. Everything else was arranged around the gospel, not the other way around. If we're honest, most of us, including myself, <coughs> arrange the gospel around our life. That's why we don't get to sow that. Right? 
to sew that, so that the whole goth look of the eight, right? Yeah, I got my, you know, really can't really talk when I get there. Yeah, so if you want to, to grow in grace, if you want your life to be a, a constant act of sanctification, following Jesus closer and closer and closer, if you want to have fruit, if you want to uh, sow an eternal legacy with your life, and the gospel has to be the hub, and everything else has to be arranged around it. If you don't make the gospel a hub, and and, and it kind of the opposite way is that, you know, I've got to work, I've got to do, blah, 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 do all these things, and wherever the gospel can fit in, how do we expect to grow? How do we expect to be effective in our sharing the gospel? I know this is really difficult. This is not simple to do, right? Because the world demands so much time. And I'm not saying... Well, if you have children or, or wife or husband, well, I've got to ignore you. So you're on your own. Go, go, find, go graze the fields, right? That's not what I'm saying, right? There are things we have to do, right? I'm not saying stay up 24 hours and don't get any sleep so your body falls apart. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is, look, examine your life. Where do you spend your time? If you go, you know, I have, I have six, I work, you know, these hours, and I have six hours that I... Um, that I'm sleeping, eating, or, or doing things that I have to do to exist, and then what about the other hours? Right? What are you doing? Are you binge watching TV? Are you doing a hobby? Not, again, none of those things are necessarily bad unless they're in the wrong place. How can you arrange your life in the in the stage of life? You are now. If you're um, younger and you have little kids at home, you have some time restraints. Let me say something, and I'm approaching that age. If you're retired, you should have more time now for ministry than ever before, right? typically. Right? Right? Well, but what I hear from a lot of older people, kind of my age, is, I've done my time. When I was younger, I served in youth group, and I did, did blah, blah, blah. Okay, excellent. I'm glad God has used you. He's not done it. You probably have more time now than you've ever had before to pray, find new hobbies to do, meet new people, right? Begin to circle the hub around, how can I leverage my time and my energy for the gospel, not learn how to do some, some new hobby. You're going to learn a whole lot of hobbies on the other side of eternity. You can learn how to play the kazoo, whatever you want to do when you see Jesus. Now, figure out what the hub is. If you want to be effective, if you want to grow in grace, if you want to produce fruit, if you want to leave an eternal legacy that has impact in this life and in generations to come, then make the gospel the hub of your life. Everything else needs to arrange itself in its proper place around that, not the other way around. And if we do that, maybe maybe some of our lives, it will say, you know, Phil uh, arranged his life with the Gospel at the Hub so that everyone in southeast Massachusetts was able to hear the Gospel. Wouldn't that be amazing? Rather than... Hey, Jesus, I'm glad to see you. And, you know, when I was uh, following you, I, I, I had an opportunity to share my faith. Really, Jesus? How many times? Once or twice. Well, what else did you do? Well, I learned how to play the kazoo really well. Okay. What's the focus of our lives? And when we look at people, we got to understand that they are not okay without the Lord. Just because they're religious. They're not okay. Just because they might know more than us in the Bible, they're not okay. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this passage. Um, it it uh, puts things back into perspective. And, and God, this is really a difficult concept for us here to understand. Because when we see people, we see people on the spectrum of good and bad that if they're a nice person, they're, they're a good family person, whatever the, the, uh, the, uh, the test we might have for them for goodness, we, we see people as good. And then we see people that, that purport to be followers of you and they've made a commitment to you and they just maybe mean and nasty. We go, how does that work, God? And 
So God, give us a, a better understanding of, of what grace really is. Grace is for the unworthy, not for those who have everything together. Jesus did not come for those who, who needed, didn't need a doctor. He came for the sick, the wounded, the broken, like us. And so God, help us to be bold in sharing the gospel uh, and, and correcting people who are religious so that they can not put all their, all their money in the religious pile, but they can put it in the pile where it says, I know you, Lord, personally, and I've accepted you as my Savior, and you're, you walk with me and I with you, and I'm going to do that to the end of my life because you have given me your spirit. And that's, Father, where we want to be. Father, help us to have the wisdom and insight to balance our lives to do the things we need to do that, that are right and good, taking care of our families and provision, whatever those things might be. But to take the time that you give us in this life and, and use it wisely, that we would, uh, in, in that, what do we call it, free time or, or available time, that we would make the gospel the hub and we'd arrange everything else of, of secondary importance around that so that um, our desires for life wouldn't be uh, what we live for, but... You would be what we live for, your desires, your purposes, God. Give us wisdom and insight, Father, we desperately need it, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen.